Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. Welcome to the Michelle Miao Show at the Commonwealth Club of California. Now, eagle-eyed viewers will have already noticed that I'm not Michelle Miao. She had to step away from today's program. She isn't feeling well, and I wish her a speedy recovery. I'm John Zipper, the club's vice president of media and editorial, host of our week-to-week -week political roundtables, and Michelle's co-host for her programs here at the Commonwealth Club. Thank you for joining us today for this discussion with the candidates seeking to succeed David Chu in representing District 17 in the California State Assembly. First, a quick note, the Commonwealth Club is producing hundreds of programs a year, even during the pandemic. So head over to commonwealthclub.org slash events for all upcoming programs. Uh, next week, in fact, Michelle and I will have a live in-person program with Jeopardy! champion Amy Schneider. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Get your tickets. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our panelists, and I'll just go alphabetically. We have David Campos, former San Francisco supervisor, former Santa Clara deputy county executive, former chief of staff with San Francisco district attorney, Chessa Bodine. Welcome, David. We also have Matt Haney, supervisor here in San Francisco, where he represents the Tenderloin, Soma, Mission Bay, Treasure Island, and downtown San Francisco. Uh, and that's district six. Welcome, Matt. Bilal Mahmoud is a former policy analyst for the Obama administration and an entrepreneur. Welcome. And Thea Selby, she's a business owner and co-founder of the Lower Hate Merchant and Neighbor Association. Now this program is not a formal debate. There'll be no clock counting down during their question, during their responses. However, there are four candidates here and we have one hour to get through quite a few topics. So responses that go longer than a couple of minutes will probably get an ever so gentle prodding from me to wrap up. Now, for our first question, I want to ask each of you basically an opening statement, if you will. Why are you running? And let's again go alphabetically for this first one. So, David, why are you running? Thank you for this opportunity, Commonwealth Club. Uh, I really uh, appreciate the opportunity to share with you my vision of how I would represent this district in the state legislature. Uh, and I want to share with you my vision for this state. Uh, I, I see a California where we stop talking about poverty and actually start ending poverty, uh, beginning with a true living wage. I see a California where homelessness is not left to the generosity of e each individual city or county, but is approached as a humanitarian challenge that the entire state must pay to solve. I see a California where we don't abandon neighborhoods or communities, uh, where what we are seeing, the tragedy uh, of the Tenderloin, would be unthinkable. Uh, a California where black and brown people are not asked to do uh, frontline work uh, for a pandemic and then are left to die in dramatically higher numbers. A California where everyone has affordable health care, where everyone has access to quality mental health care, and everyone can find effective drug and alcohol treatment when they actually need it. I see a state where we can create middle class jobs today by investing in the affordable and green energy that will save our planet tomorrow. A state where we don't confuse luxury housing with affordable housing. A state where we end hunger now in a state where we grow our economy, we do that quickly and we actually share our prosperity fairly. I see a state where we, the people, choose our elected leaders, not the corporations. We just saw what happened in Sacramento where affordable uh, universal health care, the Medicare for All program, was killed with, without even a vote. And that's because of how uh, campaigns are run. We are choosing to run corporate free because we want to be beholden only to voters, not the corporations. I hope you join us at compostforus.com. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Supervisor Haney. Uh, thanks so much uh, for having us here, and I also hope that Michelle feels better, and thank you for, for stepping in. Uh, I'm running because we have huge challenges in our state uh, that are overlapping, that are re reaching crisis levels. Uh, housing is unaffordable except for the very rich. Uh, people are unable to stay in our city because of the cost of housing. Uh, we have uh, thousands of people who are living on our streets 
Uh, homelessness is out of control, not only in San Francisco, but across the state. We have a climate crisis and emergency that is seeing every year uh, more wildfires, the threat of sea level rise, and we aren't seeing uh, the level of solutions put forward at the state level that we need. Uh, we have to send someone from San Francisco who is a proven, uh, progressive, effective leader who can act boldly, who can bring people together, and who can move our state forward. Uh, I, uh, in the benefit of California and its opportunity, I was raised by a single mom. Uh, we lived in apartments. I went to public school, public child care, uh, and I've spent my entire life in public service in this city. Um, I served on the Board of Education. I worked in the state legislature. I ran statewide organizations like the UC Student Association to expand higher education. And for the last three years, I've served in the toughest district uh, in our city and took on our toughest problems. Uh, mental health, bringing about mental health SF, inequality by passing our first voter approved overpaid executive tax, um, building more housing than any district, getting thousands of people off the streets. But none of these issues can be solved by one neighborhood or one district alone. We need every city in the state and the state as, as a whole stepping up to build more housing, to have unprecedented in investments in renewable energy, to have accountability so that everyone does their part uh, to get people off the streets into shelter, housing, and behavioral health care. Um, I'm prepared to go and do that work. I've spent my entire life fighting for these causes. Uh, and I would be very honored uh, if San Francisco sends me uh, to represent Assembly Se uh, District 17 to take on these tough challenges, uh, which I've spent my entire life doing and uh, bringing the results that we've been able to bring locally, uh, 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 being able to deliver those as the state uh, assembly member. Thank you. Thank you. Bill Long, why are you running? Uh, thanks, everyone, and thanks, Commonwealth Club, for hosting us today. Um, uh, I'm running because I think we need a new type of vision in our city. I'm running for state assembly because I believe San Francisco is a beacon of hope. Uh, it's a beacon of hope for the middle class, for people trying to break into the middle class, for immigrants, migrants, parents, youth, people of color, LGBTQ+, anyone who's searching for a better life. And all of this is important to me because I'm the child of immigrants, and so are so many in San Francisco. My parents left a dictatorship to move here. We had three generations in, in campus housing. My mom took public transit every day just to fight for our ability to get to the best public schools. She became a librarian. My mom became, my grandma became a special ed teacher. And through that, what the San Francisco Bay Area offered us, we were able to break into the middle class. And if you distill down, what does that mean? It's the middle class is the pursuit of housing and schools and safety. That's what enabled my parents and family to succeed. And that's priorities of our campaign as well. And it's a priority because the dream of the middle class is really disappearing. If you look around us in the city, the cost of rent has increased. The number of unhoused has doubled. The number of opioid debts is twice the number of COVID debts. Transit lines diminished. And we all have a climate disaster that's facing us in the next five to eight years where we have to move from mitigation to adaptation, according to IPCC reports. So I'm running for state assembly because I think we need the courage and innovation to solve these problems. We can't rely on a status quo that hasn't solved these problems for decades to expect it to solve it in the next decade. So over the last decade, I've focused across a variety of different industries. I was a scientist at Stanford Medical School, an analyst in the Obama administration, entrepreneur in the nonprofit and the private sectors, where I saw effective programs like helping workers get a guaranteed income or democratizing access to capital and technology for small businesses so they could compete with the Amazons of the world. And so the combination, I think, of science and technology and policy that's necessary to solve the next decade of challenges that we have, providing a vision of actual solutions that have worked across the country, like a built for zero plan that has solved chronic homelessness in 14 U.S. cities, or a Green New Deal that I've authored with its original co-author. And it's because of that vision that I know that our campaign has been taking off. We've raised hundreds of thousands from individual donors, mobilized hundreds of volunteers, earned dozens of endorsements in such a short period of time, all as a first-time candidate. I'm excited today to share more about that vision that's inspiring so many people in the city. And so thank you so much again for having me. Thank you. And Thea, why are you running for office? 
Yeah, so first of all, um, uh, I want to say that I am an elected official now. I am a city college trustee, and I have been for seven years. And I have to say, it's a, it's sort of the office that a lot of people forget. But um, honestly, I think it is super, super important. And we, uh, at least traditionally, we actually educate more people than the UC and the uh, CSUs combined. Um, FYI, the uh, the community college system. I'm a I'm a huge believer in the community college system. So so why am I running? Well. Let's start with the with the first eagle eye. I liked your eagle eye for those eagle eye folks out there. There is uh, one of these people who's not like the other, um, and that would be the woman. Uh, I am a, a woman, and I uh, have uh, raised a family. I'm also a parent. I'm the only parent in this race. Um, I uh, have a whole world of experiences that many of us have that comes from raising a family um, in this city. I know how hard it is. I know how challenging it is. Uh, and I think that we all deserve to have all those things that not just working families, but everybody deserves here, which is to be living in neighborhoods that are safe and thriving. You, We all deserve safe streets. We deserve good schools, fair housing, good transportation, and good community. Um, I certainly will fight for our working families, but I also uh, will fight for small business. For the last 20 years, in addition to uh, working in government, I have worked as a small business owner. And I run this business. I know how hard it is to run small business in San Francisco. I have actual experience doing it. Um, and uh, I want to make sure that our small businesses are able to come through COVID and thrive. I really believe they're the backbone of San Francisco, and we can't leave them behind. Um, as I mentioned, I'm a twice citywide elected City College of San Francisco trustee. And there I've been fighting for the most disadvantaged students uh, in our city for the last seven years. I've negotiated two 1,500 unit housing projects. Um, I have secured $400,000 for our students so that they can campaign for a free Rams transit pass. Uh, I've balanced the budget with my colleagues and we've hired a permanent chancellor with the CPA to get us back to fiscally thriving. And much of that was done during COVID. I'm running because I see the highs and lows of this beautiful district. I've been walking across the entire district. I see, you know, the Tenderloin, which is treated like a containment zone. And I know what that's like because I got involved in politics because of a double homicide across the street from my house um, and brought the community together, created the Lower Hate Merchant and Neighbor Association, which continues to thrive to this day. Nobody should have to live in a containment zone. And certainly not the, the 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 most kids and the most immigrants who often live in the in the tenderloin. But there are other places that are full of beauty. I mean, the tenderloin is full of beauty, but also you know that don't have some of the downsides. Um, there's also Chinatown where people have suffered horrible anti Asian hate. Um, and so my two main platforms are to keep education as the ladder of opportunity for all from pre-K to college. And then secondly, to make sure that we're meeting or exceeding our climate goals, whether through building housing or safe public transportation. And as I mentioned at the beginning, over 70% of the assembly is male. It's been 20 years since we have elected a woman in this district, and I'd be honored with your vote. OK, thank you all. And of course, you brought up a number of issues in, in your various responses that we're going to get into more uh, during our talk here today. One of those is health care. And uh, recently, AB 1400, uh, the California single payer uh, health care bill recently died in committee. Um, talk a bit, if you would. Was that the right bill? Should that bill be resurrected? Should it be resurrected in different form? Or what is a different vision you would try to implement if you were in, put uh, in office in Sacramento? Let's start with you, Matt Haney. Uh, absolutely, it's the, it's the right vision. Uh, we need Medicare for all in, in California. Uh, it's something that I think is a model that we see all over uh, the world and it works. Uh, having healthcare that is driven by the profit motive um, it fails so many people, it shuts people out, it makes people unable to receive the care that they absolutely require. So I am a strong supporter of AB 1400. I have the, the support of the California Nurses Association and uh, Assemblymember Oshkara, who are the sponsors. You know, we need to bring it back. It will be a top priority for me to make sure we get the number of votes 
uh, that it will take to move this forward. Um, along with that, we also have to make sure that we expand uh, care for people right now. We have to make sure that we bring more people in to Medi-Cal. We have to make sure that more people qualify for Medi-Cal. That was a priority of the governor that we can continue to build on. Um, and another thing that, that I will really focus on is making sure that there's parity uh, in services and access for mental health care and drug treatment. You know, these are things that far too often are treated as something that is optional or not given at least the care or follow through that is required when we see in our city that the failure to provide everyone with mental health care is, is a huge concern and, and, and something that I think our state needs to provide a lot more funding and services for. It's something I've done here as a co-author of Mental Health SF, but everywhere, every hospital needs to be held accountable to deliver not only health care when you get when you break an arm, but when you when you have depression or schizophrenia or a drug addiction. Um, these are things that I will really uh, focus on, as well as uh, fighting hard to get us uh, to pass AD 1400 and, and Medicare for all. OK, the uh, next, what would your health care approach be? And was the AB 1400 the one to go with? Yeah, so I mean, to be honest, and and uh, I was surprised that there was no vote. Um, I, I I think it would have been good for us to be able to understand to have that kind of you know debate, open debate, um, so that we can so that we could understand what are the issues, what are not the issues, and the fact that it wasn't able to come up for a vote, I thought was was um, was too bad. Um, there are certainly, um, I, I know what people say the issues were, and, and I'll sort of state some of them and say whether I agree or disagree with them. Um, I think one of the issues is, is that there are powerful forces that are trying to make sure that this doesn't happen. Um, I think, let's just put it on the table. There are insurance companies, uh, and there are uh, even some healthcare uh, hospitals and things like that that are not interested in seeing this happen. I think one one thing we can do on that, which we have attempted to do in other cases with the Democratic Party, which tends to give a lot of the money that is uh, from big corporations to candidates, is we can say we don't want just as we don't want health, uh, uh, fossil fuel uh, money or tobacco money, maybe we also don't want insurance money or, uh, you know, healthcare, some kind of healthcare, you know, money that, that comes from people who are against getting this, because it is absolutely clear that the people of California want health care. They want universal health care. So why can't we get it? I think we have to look at that really, really carefully. Um, as far as AB 14 itself, and there's two other things I think we need to think about. One is, you know, I would go into the, the assembly immediately and start talking to people. Um, and by that, I mean the assembly people in particular. Why, you know, do you like this? Do you not like this? What do you like about it? What do you don't not like about it? How do we get to yes? And that's part of why I'm going to the assembly. Uh, I like to talk to different kinds of people. I like to have conversations that are not necessarily all that easy. Um, and I think we need to, and try and come to yes, we need to figure out where is our common ground because we need this for the people of California. Specifically, one thing that I think was not included in this particular AB 14 that um, I recently was told by some Canadians, which I believe that this was based on, uh, they have in their AB, whatever their, their health care is called, um, is um, uh, subsidized daycare and subsidized elder care. So these folks were younger and they said they pay $7 a day for their, um, for their daycare, uh, for their children. Uh, and that is for many, many people. And I don't know if that's subsidized. I don't know what that is, but that's affordable in a way that unfortunately our daycare and our elder care absolutely are not. And these are huge issues for us. So those are three things I might do on AB 1400. Okay, thank you. Bilal, your position on AB 1400 and uh, healthcare in general. Yeah, and unequivocally support AB 1400. Um, it's because single payer and, and universal healthcare has played a deep important part of my life through my personal and professional career. Um, I actually wrote my graduate thesis in, in Cambridge University on the effect of Obamacare on, on healthcare access. Um, living in a country where we had universal healthcare, saw the benefits of it, writing about Obamacare passing for the first time. Um, and then coming back to the States, I actually struggled with healthcare access uh, several times. I, I remember aging out of my parents' insurance um, when I turned 26. Uh, a couple months later, I became unemployed. 
Uh, and for six months, I didn't have a job and went on to Obamacare, which was great. Um, and thankfully it passed, but uh, I still cost money. And being broke and struggling for rent for six months, as I reflected, uh, having to take medication, um, if I was type one diabetic and uh, the months that it took to get onto the program, as well as being off that insurance, uh, it could have been fatal if I was type one diabetic, diabetic and I couldn't afford to pay the insulin that I needed. So having been unemployed and having had to deal with health insurance over, over many years, I understand the importance of it. It's personal to me. It's personal to our generation. It's personal to elderly. Um, and we need to fight for this with conviction and to ensure that we have universal health care here in California. So I 100% support single-payer health care and will pledge to reintroduce it as best we can, working with the original co-authors and those that, in the Assembly and the Senate as well. Um, in terms of what to do next time, uh, I agree with, with things Supervisor Haney said as well. Uh, let's bolster uh, the, in the interim Medi-Cal for all, um, ensure that we can bolster that program, increase funding, increase funding for, for disability uh, insurance as well uh, in that context. I think to get it passed next time, I would talk to existing legislators and see what was missing, uh, build a broader coalition between the small business community as well as the different facets who are pushing it, but also look at maybe alternative taxing mechanisms. Um, I think there was a lot of concern this time around the how we're going to fund it. So look at different ways of funding it so that we can maybe build a broader coalition and get it passed to get the, the outcomes that we need. Thank you. And David Campos, AB 1400 and healthcare. Yeah, I want to say two things about this. First of all, let me say that while I appreciate the work that Assembly Member Kalra did on this, I think that not putting it up for a vote was a huge mistake. Uh, and I respectfully and strongly disagree with that. And, and I just, I wanna be clear that for communities, poor communities, communities of color, this is a life and death situation. Uh, you, you look at the Latino community and Latinos in California uh, were dying at, an, at, an, at, at a time, at, at a rate eight times higher than their white counterparts. Because and they're dying because of a lack of access to affordable quality health care. So it is a life and death situation. And I think these communities deserve a vote. But the second thing, going back to to what Trustee Selby said, I think it's really it goes to the heart of this. The reason this happened is because of money. You have a lobby that is against Medicare for all. It's it includes the medical lobby. And the reason that a supermajority of Democrats has not passed this important piece of legislation is because you're electing people who say one thing, but at the same time, they're taking money from the very people that oppose those things that they supposedly support. And in this case, the medical lobby killed this bill. And in the same way that I think it is wrong to take money from police unions that oppose criminal justice reform, I think it is wrong to take money from the medical lobby that is opposing Medicare for all. And, and I'll, I'll ask the question again, Supervisor Haney, you have taken money from the medical association, from the dental association that are opposing Medicare for all and just killed it in Sacramento. Will you give the money back? Matt Haney, do you want to respond? Sure. Well, um, you know, David Campos, I appreciate the question. I know you also sought the endorsement of the California Medical Association and the California Dental Association and asked for contributions from them. And so now that, that the doctors and dentists have supported me, uh, you're, you're singing a different tune. But the, the truth is that the doctors and dentists are folks that I uh, disagree with very openly and vehemently on single payer health care. They know that. Um, I've been very clear about where I stand on this. Uh, as I said, I'm proud to have the support of the California Nurses Association and many organizations that support uh, uh, AB 1400. But of course, I'm going to work with the doctors and dentists on the many important things, including mental health care that I talked about and other issues that I've worked on with them here, including mental health SF. So we can have disagreements on some issues with the doctors and dentists and also believe that we can work together strongly to ensure that we expand healthcare act access uh, for more Californians. Let's move on to another big topic. And that is of course, housing. Housing is an issue across the country in, in many, if not most cities, um, both uh, shortage of housing, housing, rising housing costs, rental and for sale. Um, San Francisco tends to kind of be the, the uh, the poster child, though, if you will, of, of high cost housing, difficulty in building housing. Um, and, and of course, people just 
priced completely out of housing, out of the cities or even into the streets. So starting with you, Bilal, what should legislators in Sacramento do to address the housing shortage and the high cost of housing in California? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'll start off by saying the issue of housing is central to uh, my evolution and my journey here in America. My parents immigrated here 35 years ago, um, it was three generations of affordable campus housing, and then proceeded to a two bedroom and then to market rate housing by the time I was 10. And what it taught me informs a lot of our approach, my approach to housing as well is that housing is the gateway to the middle class. It is a ladder. It is a ladder to ensure that we go from affordable housing to market rate housing to bridge that gap for so many immigrants, migrants, we're all migrants in our own country. Uh, and that's why housing is so central to the debate of this election, because it is the ladder by which we achieve social mobility. And that's what San Francisco represents. So combined with being a renter myself, I know personally the importance of housing and will act with the courage and conviction without special interest to inform our policies. So how do we solve the housing shortage? It's quite simple. Um, we do three things. We, we build more housing uh, and we build more housing by banning exclusionary zoning, streamlining permitting through by right development, supporting modular housing, which the Chronicle covered a great article um, just yesterday about how even uh, modular housing through SB 35, which was able to accelerate the particular housing developments here in the city, was able to get housing produced at half the cost and as a result was half the rent. Um, and so that's how we actually build more housing. But that will take some time, several years to build. So how do we support renters today? Um, at a federal level, there's Section 8 housing vouchers, but it's drastically underfunded and it takes too long to get it into people who are in a lottery system. So we need to support things like a guaranteed income for all, uh, up to $500 a month for every household that's under $75,000 in income. And I know this is effective because I've seen it in my nonprofit work where we were supporting workers that were laid off during the pandemic to get a guaranteed income. They're able to afford to pay rent and healthcare and stay in the Bay Area. And so it's this holistic and evidence-based approach to solution making and unequivocal support for building more housing so people can live here and have a guaranteed income to afford to live here. That's how we solve the housing crisis and make it affordable for people to live here. That's why leading organizations like Yimby Action and California Yimby have endorsed us as well and why we'll succeed in solving this problem once we're elected to. Okay, thank you. David Campos, housing. I believe that we need to build more of all types of housing. And I am proud of the record that I have, not only in approving many projects as a supervisor, thousands of units of housing, but the record that I had as a deputy county executive in Santa Clara County, overseeing the implementation of a housing bond aimed at building 4,500 units of affordable housing. Uh, I think that the job of the assembly person, especially in this particular role, uh, is to promote the building of more housing. The one area, though, that I think I, I would focus on and that is missing is building affordable housing. And, and let me just very be very clear about this campaign. Uh, we just learned that the realtors, the landlords of San Francisco, have created an independent expenditure to oppose my candidacy. The landlords of San Francisco in this city, the wealthy landlords, have made it clear that they do not want me elected to the state assembly. And the reason for that is because they know that I'm gonna be a champion for tenants' rights and that I am going to be a champion for affordable housing. You know, people talk about how we need to build housing so that people can, you know, live near where they work. If we don't build housing that is affordable to the, the middle class, to, to working class people, we are creating a society where the people that work in our restaurants, who teach our kids in our schools, that take care of our, of our children, of our parents, that they will no longer be able to live in San Francisco. We need affordable housing built. And I don't believe that the market, if left to its own devices, will build that affordable housing because if left to its own choices, developers will build the, the housing that maximizes profits for them and that's luxury housing. And that's why from the beginning of this campaign, I've said we need to have an affordable housing bond at the state level that actually funds affordable housing for not just low income individuals, for middle income folks. And I would include in that first responders. You know, 70 percent of our of our police officers in a similar percentage of firefighters live outside the city. God forbid there is a natural disaster. How are we going to respond appropriately? This requires investment by government. And that's, I have a track record of doing that. And that's what I'm gonna do if elected to promote 
at the statewide level, the building of more affordable housing. Okay, Matt Haney. Well, the first thing is that we have a, a housing shortage in our uh, city, in our state. We have to build a lot more housing in San Francisco and all over the state. Uh, in San Francisco, over the next eight years, we're going to need to build over 80,000 units of housing. And that's the law now uh, under, under state laws that require us to set a goal with our housing element. Um, in order to do that, we're going to need very aggressive changes. Uh, in my district, we are building most of the housing uh, in District 6 currently for the city and county. Uh, we built more housing, more affordable housing, more supportive housing, more shelter beds by far than any other district. And I've supported and shepherded the overwhelming majority of it, uh, even sometimes when others, other politicians have said no. Uh, some folks may have heard about the nearly 500 units of housing on a valet parking lot that folks shot down. Um, we can't allow that to happen. Uh, we need to get uh, uh, changes to zoning so that uh, housing can be built in more places and the state is gonna have to intervene for that. For the communities uh, and, and cities that have been exclusionary where they haven't built any housing, including any affordable housing, uh, we're gonna have to have minimum zoning standards uh, so that we build more housing. Um, we've done that here and need to do a lot more of it. Uh, and we're going to need to aggressively invest in affordable housing and tenant protections. Um, the, the reality is uh, that uh, we've got to keep more people in their homes. We have to overturn cost of Hawkins. Uh, I am a, a renter myself and live in a rent control building. I've defended people in court who face evictions. Uh, we need more tenants in the legislature, uh, but we also need uh, much more, much greater investments with affordable housing bonds, with social housing, uh, with taxing big corporations and billionaires to invest in affordable housing and supportive housing. Uh, I've been on the front lines of that and been able to actually deliver, not just talk about it. Uh, and I would be able to, to, to move us forward on what are very aggressive housing goals, uh, but necessary ones to be able to reduce the cost of housing for everyone, uh, especially working people. Thank you. And Thea, housing. Yeah, thank you. Um, so yes, I, I, I do you know, have to emphasize what a crisis we're in because everyone from the homeless who deserve housing where we have, you know, no transit, we don't have enough transitional housing for the 8,000 plus uh, homeless that we have here in San Francisco to the veterans who come to city college in San Francisco because they get more money in San Francisco than they do anywhere else in the state. But a lot of them live in their cars because they don't want to spend the money that they get on housing to the seniors who I've been to several eviction rallies over the last couple of months. And seniors are terrified. They're afraid of losing their housing and not being able to, you know, to, to stay in a place where they spent their entire lives to youth. I have uh, two children myself at 20 and a 24, and neither one of them would ever consider moving back to San Francisco because it's just too expensive. Um, and I have to go to our vision. And I, I was part of something called Connect SF, and it was a, a, a giant project uh, made up of probably over 100 stakeholders, including a lot of community-based organizations here in San Francisco across the city. They did a very good job of outreach. And, 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 and also the business community, all of the people that you would hope would be in one room at the same time. And the purpose of the group was to try and come up with some sort of a general vision of San Francisco. And they started with these opposing views of sort of, well, do you want everyone to live behind gated uh, gated communities, you know, where the poor people live somewhere else and they commute in uh, two hours, three hours a day. And, you know, you could see people just starting to just sort of go, no, that's not what I want. And eventually where we came to was we want a diverse city full of people of different incomes, different ethnicities, different jobs, different backgrounds. It's a city, you know, that's what a city should be great public transportation, tons of housing, all of these things, no gated communities, you know, this kind of, this is where it came down to. So given that, given that that's what San Franciscans want, and I believe that's probably pretty accurate, um, I think we have to look at the three things that stop housing. And the first is land, and the second is money, and the third is political will. 
Um, and uh, land is, is, is rough here, but we can uh, build up in, in places that people haven't really thought of. I particularly have, you know, I think it would be great to have corridors that are like the Champs-Élysées, you know, the, the Geary Corridor or other corridors that are sort of big transit where you can just build up maybe four or five stories instead of having, you know, uh, skyscrapers in Matt's district, mostly. Um, I think also uh, that, so that's the land part. There's not much land, but we can build up and should. Um, the second is the money part, and that is a little tougher. Uh, but David Chu has given us the Bay Area Housing Authority, uh, which is a means of um, being able to get money for housing at a regional level. And I think I think many of us believe that we have to think regionally, that we're not just going to have to think of San Francisco, but we really are a region of Northern California. And I would be the first to go to Baja, as it's called, and, and do, do our best to get housing measures up and going because we need more money for housing. Um, also, back in the past, federal and states, both the feds and the states provided a lot of the money for affordable housing. They talk a lot at Yindi about penciling out. Um, and they say, well, we just can't pencil out this, um, this housing. And um, that's true, especially as expensive as it is to build housing. So we're going to have to use the state and the feds as we used to, to help fund. Um, so I think that's something that I feel very strongly about is they need to come back into the affordable housing game because frankly, market rate housing for 99.9% .9 of us is not in any way, shape or form affordable, which is not the definition, the typical definition of what market rate is. Um, and lastly, I'll just say that I'm running to, so that we can get to yes. Uh, we do. We did see in that one particular case with 495 units that were going to be built at, at Stevenson that um, the, everybody came up with a different reason. It wasn't like it was a, this is the reason why this project was bad. We had, you know, I can't remember how many supervisors, eight supervisors, and they all had different reasons why they weren't opposed to this. We've got to get to the culture of getting to yes. If we can't get to yes, we're not going to get this done. The political will is really, really important. I am really excited about for the next 12 years, if the voters would have me working on that kind of way of thinking, let's get to yes. Well, whoever is elected in this seat uh, will, of course, be dealing with lots of hot button issues. Perhaps none is even hotter than the issue of crime in the city. This summer, San Franciscans will be voting on whether to recall San Francisco District Attorney Jessa Bodine. Do you support or oppose the recall of Bodine and why or why not? And let's stick with you first, Thea. Mm -hmm. So that's a that's a that's a great question that I have been struggling with. To be honest, I have gone back and forth between uh, no and I'm not sure, um, and I'm back to I'm not sure. I'm afraid, um, and that's partially because I took part in a rally uh, uh, that was for Grandpa Visha. Uh, who was a Thai gentleman. Uh, he was 83 years old, I believe, when he was fatally attacked, uh, not far away from uh, Japantown, um, right, not, right, right next to Target, actually, on Geary. Um, and um, I heard stories that, that, that day um, from people who really felt that um, our district attorney, unfortunately, was not there for us in terms of victims' rights. Um, and I do feel it's really important to know who your constituency is. Um, and I support the recall of the teachers, excuse me, of the, of the Board of Education. And the reason I support the recall of the Board of Education is because their constituency, as far as I'm concerned, were the students and they neglected them. They really neglected them. They you know, were involved in all sorts of other things. I'm not as concerned about that, but they couldn't make a plan to figure out how to get the children safely back to school. So as far as Chesa Boudin is, I, I, I am now back on the, I'm not sure what my position is, but I think what, what, what would change my mind one way or the other is to see accountability, to see him take some responsibility uh, for some of the things that he's done, for him to be a little more serious about victims' rights. I really feel like the victims here have got to be, you know, front and center um, in this picture. David Campos. Well, thank you for that question. And I think it's important to uh, make sure that there is accurate information about, about what has happened. Uh, I oppose the recall of Chesa Boudin. I'm proud that I worked with him 
uh, as chief of staff. And one of the things that I'm actually the proudest in terms of the work that was done is to prioritize victim services. Uh, when Chesa became DA, there was one person in that entire victim services unit that spoke uh, Cantonese. And we proceeded to hire an entire team of folks who are Cantonese speakers who come from the community to reach out to those communities. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the focus on victim services was so great that there was actually a hiring of the first ever Chinese American woman heading victim services in that unit. Uh, and I think with respect to the case uh, that was highlighted, uh, I'm glad that uh, the maximum penalties were sought in that case. So I think that there is uh, uh, a need to have more information provided about the work that's being done. That said, I always think that more has to be done when it, with respect to the hate crimes that have target, targeted the API community. This is a very personal issue for me. Uh, I'm married to a Korean American man, and, and I'll be honest, during the time that some of these incidents have been taking place, I've been worried about what happens if he goes out. Is he going to be the target uh, of, of uh, a hate crime? And I do think that the state has a very important role to play. Uh, I commend the work that uh, Assembly Member Phil Ting, as the chair of the Budget Committee, did in identifying more than $100 million to uh, address the needs of the API community in the state of California, including the needs of victims uh, that are targeted by crime. The other thing that I think is important, and I speak as, as a former police commissioner who pushed for this, I think that we need more connection between law enforcement, not just the DA's office, but the police department as well, and these communities, especially these monolingual communities. I, I would actually introduce a bill that requires language ability for people that are assigned in communities that are predominantly monolingual. I can tell you from my own experience, having represented uh, the Portola in District 9, uh, a heavily uh, uh, Chinese-speaking neighborhood, it was always a challenge to get SFPD to have Cantonese speakers assigned to walk the beat. And that's a challenge because if you don't have people who speak the language, who understand the culture of these communities, people are afraid to come forward and report a crime, including a hate crime. And so I think that there's a lot more to be done, but I think that the, the recall of Chase Abudin, and there's a report that was done about this, it's funded by these ultra millionaires, many of them Republican, uh, I don't think that it reflects the values of San Francisco. San Franciscans, I do think, want reform. They also want accountability, and I think that there is a way to have both. Thank you. Uh, Bilal Mahmoud, how do you stand on the Chase of question? Yeah, so I, I think the district attorney is incompetent. Um, I have not endorsed him. Uh, I don't plan to vote for him if he makes it past the recall. Um, but. I am still weighing whether his incompetence rises to the level of malfeasance, which I think is the criteria for uh, a recall or impeachment in other contexts as well. And I'll evaluate over the months ahead um, how that continues to develop. Uh, but I think the, the larger thing we need to acknowledge here is that I think there's a lot of conversation in San Francisco about is crime up, is crime down? And I think we need to acknowledge that San Franciscans don't feel safe right now. Uh, if you look at the numbers on a per capita basis, theft, burglary, homicides are up. Anti-Asian hate crimes have increased, I think, upwards of 500%. Um, and small businesses in the middle class are the ones who suffer the most. Um, I remember when we were all focused on the Louis Vuitton robberies uh, a couple of months back, no one talked about how in Chinatown, uh, jewelry stores were robbed just days before. I talked to one of the jewelry store owners and she didn't have insurance to cover it like Louis Vuitton did. And that's who actually gets impacted by how crime is, is rising here across the city. And so I think outside of just this question, we need to push back against this narrative and stop gaslighting our residents and our, and our residents and our citizens and listen to victims, listen to parents and elderly and Asian Americans who are frankly dissatisfied with the outcomes of our city and acknowledge the facts of the leadership in the city that needs to be held accountable. So if you look at the DA, I mean, the things that he has direct control over, it's not great. Um, he's lost 40% of his staff. Uh, conviction rates for violent crime have decreased under his tenure. These are things in his control. And so he should be held accountable in some capacity. 
how that accountability will arrive. I think like many San Franciscans, I'm still weighing. And I do think recalls are a democratic tool that should be used, just like impeachment is used uh, for malfeasance. And in the case of the school board, I have endorsed the recall of all three school board members. I think their actions rises to the level of malfeasance. But like many San Franciscans, still trying to assess um, whether the incompetence of our current district attorney rises to that level. And I'll, I'll continue to follow over the next couple of months and see, see how that evolves. Okay. And Matt Haney. Uh, you know, I, I, I agree that our, our residents don't feel safe right now. Uh, it's something that I work on uh, every day in, in my district. Um, I'm on the phone with our police captain, our police chief, nearly every day, including this morning, about uh, the more support that we need in, in neighborhoods like the Tenderloin and South of Market. Uh, but it's not only these two neighborhoods. People across our city uh, do not feel safe. Uh, they do not feel heard. Uh, they deserve to to see uh, changes uh, and seriousness in, in response to crime. Uh, and we shouldn't have to choose between criminal justice reform and public safety. Uh, we need both of those things. A mass incarceration uh, did not keep people safe. Uh, it did not support our city, our communities, but we do need effective consequences for crime. Um, that has to include access to collaborative courts. It has, has to include true responsiveness around victims' rights. It has to uh, include um, drug treatment and diversion programs that are effective. Um, these are things that I will fight for at the state level um, and that I will work to, to deliver. Um, we, we have a responsibility to keep our residents safe. Um, I don't support the, the recall of Chase Boudin. I don't believe that he's uh, done anything at the level, as, as uh, Bilal said, of, of malfeasance. Um, I do support the mission of criminal justice reform, and I will work with him uh, to help deliver that and, and also make sure that we work hard together uh, to keep our uh, community safe. And I think our state assembly member has to understand that crime is a serious issue and be able to bring real solutions to it. Now, uh, I think it was beginning of January, we instituted, uh, we being the city of San Francisco, instituted a, a, the mayor's state of emergency declaration for the tender line. Uh, Matt Haney, of course, were, are on the board of supervisors. You had a vote on this. Um, so I'll, I'll start with you asking you, why did you vote the way you did? And what do you think this will accomplish? And then I want, I'll ask the others, how would they have, I know this is not the position they're running for, but what are their thoughts on this state of emergency and maybe how would they have voted? So, Matt. You know, I, I live in the Tenderloin. I have for, for many years. I work with residents there. I fight for uh, safety and health and housing for that neighborhood every single day. I walk the neighborhood every day. Um, and if there isn't a state of emergency, a public health emergency, when it comes to particularly drug overdoses in that neighborhood and around our, our city, then that term has no meaning. Um, it's actually something I've been calling for the mayor to, to implement since I got elected. In 2019, I asked the mayor to declare a state of emergency and passed a resolution and met with her repeatedly about it. Uh, just weeks before she made the declaration, I had us, I authored another resolution where we asked her to, to to, to declare a state of emergency. We've done a lot to respond, mental health SF, more supportive housing, community ambassadors on every block, more foot patrols, but we need an emergency crisis level response in the Tenderloin. Uh, and the mayor is the one who has the authority to do that. She oversees all of our city departments. Uh, we need an emergency response similar to what we saw during COVID, and that's what I've been demanding and using every tool that I have to try to get implemented. But I'm, I'm supportive of the mayor declaring a public health state of emergency. It's something that I know that we've needed, that I've demanded. Uh, and now I'm working hard with our city departments to actually deliver results. We opened a linkage center, which has already gotten hundreds of people connected to care. We need many, many more types of implementation, implementation like that or interventions like that. So um, I'm, I'm in the middle of it. I've been fighting for it. Uh, we need the state of emergency here, but we also need statewide solutions to confront the fentanyl epidemic, the drug epidemic, the lack of care, the lack of housing, which isn't just a tenderloin issue. When we help 20 people in the Tenderloin, 20 more people show up. If we're going to solve the problems in the Tenderloin, we need every neighborhood and every city in the entire state stepping up as well. PSLB, your thoughts on the declaration of emergency? 
Yeah, I, I, I too support it. Um, and I, I support it because I actually work uh, uh, with a, one of my clients is uh, in a northern county and they're working on homelessness and eradicating homelessness itself. And of course, one of the, the primary things that you have to do is find a one stop shop. Um, create a place where our homeless don't need to go from place to place to place, literally often in different locations, um, but instead have it be much more managed in a, in a uh, collaborative uh, way. And that's one thing that the linkage center is able to do, which I really appreciate. Um, you know, the way that we got my neighborhood, which was a containment zone as well, when I moved in there um, to become safe was to come together. And it was by working with the police, with the politicians, and especially with the community. Um, and I think that uh, the, the linkage center, if we combine it with these other things, uh, can be really helpful. There are some things that I have been reported to be said. I don't know if they actually have been said, but uh, that, that the mayor has talked about um, jailing those who are taking drugs. I honestly don't know if she said that or not, but I read that a couple of times. I don't think that that is effective. Uh, what I think would be effective, however, um, and I, you know, have repeatedly said this is we have to get the bad guys. There are people who are uh, dealing drugs um, and we need to get them uh, uh, prosecuted. We need to we need to get them off our streets too. Um, fentanyl is way, way, way too easy to get. Um, and I think if we can take care of our the folks who are, you know, drug addicted and the folks who have mental illness, as well as work on the supply side, and that can be done from a not just a local, but also these people come from other counties as well. So this may need a statewide approach um, as well. Okay, thank you. David Campos, the emergency declaration for the Tender Line. Well, let me say this, that clearly what's happening in the Tenderloin is an emergency. Uh, I agree on that. Uh, and, and quite frankly, you know, where I give the mayor credit is that at least she has tried to do something because the Tenderloin did not get to where it is overnight. Uh, it got to where it is because it's been neglected. And, and I'm sorry to say that a lot of talk has, has taken place out of the supervisor's office but not a lot of action. And I think that action is needed. The problem I have with what the mayor has done is that I don't believe that we're going to simply arrest our way out of what's happening in the Tenderloin. Uh, yes, uh, low level drug dealers need to be held accountable and they have been charged and they have been prosecuted. On the enforcement piece, you actually have to focus on curtailing the supply of fentanyl and other drugs. But what I think is needed, and, and this is what I think is missing in the action, is we need to have bold action that actually inundate, inundates this neighborhood. It floods it with services. And the first thing that should have been happening when we declare a state of emergency was the opening of a safe injection site. We need a safe injection site to keep people from dying. About two people are dying a day from overdoses, uh, from an overdose of fentanyl. We need to change that. And that's where I think that having the experience of, of doing something on this issue is critical. When I was a supervisor, I was the first supervisor to open, not talk about opening, but open a navigation center in my district. I introduced legislation that required the opening of other navigation centers, including a safe injection site. And as a deputy county executive in Santa Clara, I oversaw the building of a fort of, of supportive housing connected to services so that we could not only get people off the street, but actually keep them off the street. That's where I think I come in. My experience as a supervisor, as an administrator, put me in a unique position to do what I think is needed to address homelessness. We need the state to declare it as a statewide emergency because that's what it is. The state needs to step in and to intervene because Leaving it simply to cities like San Francisco to do it on their own is not working. It won't work. We need the state to treat it as the statewide crisis that it is. In Bilal. Um, so I definitely supported uh, and support the state of emergency declaration um, by the mayor. Uh, and I did so for two reasons. One is the framework of the proposal balances compassion for individuals who are struggling with 
fortitude against those who are creating the situation in the tenderloin. Um, compassion, and it's learned from the responses by the Department of Emergency Management that was developing uh, our COVID response, and it applied the same methodology through the Linkage Center uh, to ensure that we treat people who are struggling to get them the services they needed through compassionate care and triage those services appropriately. Um, but it also acted with fortitude. Um, Harvard-based uh, Harvard studies have shown that one of the most effective and probably only effective use of police is on targeted uh, high-risk areas and focused patrols. Um, I'm generally in favor of reducing police presence in ways that they're not helpful from removing them from traffic stops or um, and high, and those kind of components, but one of the most effective areas is having more targeted patrols in high-risk areas. And that's what the data declaration did. Um, and I think that's why the, the, the pod has been very fascinating. If you can walk by the linkage center, uh, you'll see there's many people coming in and they're actually trying to get services now. It's been very encouraging to see. Um, but I think the, the second part that we need to go a little bit further, um, and I think we need to go to science and evidence. I'm, I'm a researcher from Stanford Medical School by, by training, and I've worked in policy in the Obama administration as well as in the private sector. And I think if you look from a science and evidence-based approaches, there are other solutions that have worked that can take this a step further called drug market intervention strategies that have reduced drug dealing, opioid dealing by double digits in, in states like North Carolina. And what they do is they do a com combination of compassion with uh, guaranteed prosecution. So on the first offense, it ensures you have a community intervention, uh, but on the second offense is guaranteed prosecution. So those are the types of things we want to implement here in California is to ensure that we have broader DMI strategies that will get at the root of the problem, but also make sure we're going after the fentanyl dealers who are, are creating the problem in the first place. Um, unless we get the organized cartels and go after the supply chain of crime, organized cartels, the people who are, who are shipping in the precursors of fentanyl here into our state, we're not going to be able to truly solve the problem because uh, it effectively is a loaded weapon when we serve when, when fentanyl is on our streets. And so we need to tackle the supply chain in addition to the work that the mayor uh, mayor's office has done with the Zeta Declaration and continue to expand on that as well. Okay. In a little bit, we're going to be wrapping up our program with a kind of final statements from each of you. One question before then, and this is maybe from left field, but um, there are folks who have been working very much uh, in, if you will, in defense of democracy in this country, trying to deal with you know, the post-insurrection uh, efforts to undermine elections and voting and such. And, and a frequent complaint from the, those quarters is if the Democrats understand how critical the situation is, they should be acting like it. Um, you know, Democratic legislators, Democratic governors, et cetera. Uh, if you're in the state legislature and let's say there's a Donald Trump reelected in 2024 or some other nationalist populist uh, uh, candidate, what can California do to protect its democratic systems? And is there anything that can be done proactively before such an, uh, a time? So, um, Bilal, why don't you go first? Yeah, um, I actually think we should be worried about 2022, um, not 2024. Uh, Republicans are stacking secretaries of state across the country right now, uh, which could theoretically overturn elections that they tried to do in 2020. And so I think we need to be focused on how do we stop that before we have to eventually deal with the problem of, of what they try to do once they take over. And I think we have to assess why are Republicans uh, winning? Um, and I think we're losing because we're no longer talking to voters on the issues that matter to them. Look at the studies that show which demographics are shifting. It's parents who wants to keep their schools open. It's immigrants, especially Asian Americans who want STEM education, who want assurances of public safety. I think step one to staving off this disaster is making sure that we talk about the issues that matter to our constituents um, and the constituents that are shifting more and more to the other side. Um, step two is being effective at our jobs. Um, we as Democrats have to be held to a higher standard than Republicans. Republicans just want to obstruct everything and do nothing. It's very easy for them to do nothing. But as Democrats, we're trying to actually solve problems. We're trying to solve homelessness. We're trying to solve housing, deliver on climate change, deliver on health care. And so we have to actually prove that we're effective and we have a moral responsibility here in San Francisco to prove that. And I think that's why this election is so critical, because for years, San Francisco has been failing to deliver on outcomes and a status quo. And this election is super important because we have to prove that we can deliver and prove that our democratic policies are effective. And so we have to be successful here in San Francisco because then goes California and so goes the country and so goes the world. Um, and that's, I think, the, the best way to actually solve this is preventative measures is to ensure that we're effective at our policies, that we elect people who actually can get things done and achieve outcomes. And that will prove the Democratic Party is the party for our country. And that's what we need to do. Um, but should disaster fall us, and most projections unfortunately show that um, Republicans may take over the House, um, 
I mean, to be focused on like the things they're probably going to do to, 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 to disrupt our democracy, gerrymandering, voter suppression, disinformation, uh, disinformation is something I'm deeply concerned about an increasing frequency and perpetuating out of sight, outside of control. And so we need further oversight of the companies and, and, and private sector that are, are kind of perpetuating this information and having worked in both the public and the private sector, want to ensure that we bridge legislation to combat disinformation, eliminate doxing, and actually have an understanding of how those, those components work and fight for that going forward. But uh, I think that the, the best solution is to ensure that we're effective at our, at our platform and elect democratic leaders um, who will get change and outcomes actually done. And the second is really combating uh, voter suppression, disinformation, information in the years ahead. Okay, your thoughts, Thea? I guess I think a little bit differently on this. Um, I, I think one of our, our issues that we have in this country right now is that we don't talk to each other. And I think, unfortunately, that COVID has made that issue worse. Um, I think the whole, you know, uh, I, I listen to people uh, like Annie Chung, who is the executive director of Self-Help for the Elderly, which is a really renowned uh, an old, uh, you know, uh, well-known nonprofit, and, and it started in Chinatown, and they they work with with elders all over uh, San Francisco and perhaps beyond. And she was talking about anti-Asian hate and why she thought it happened. And she said the reason she thought it happened is because we other people, meaning you know, we are able to take some people and say, oh, they are not us. And unfortunately, then we turn we turn them into inhuman. We turn them into non-humans by othering them. And therefore, by non-othering them, we're able to do things to them that we would never do to people that we that we that we look at as like us. And so I guess one of the things that I'd like to see, and Trump really blew it for our country, I really feel like he really blew it. He really, you know, he caused us to go into fighting mode and into corners. And what I'd like to see happen over the next couple of years is for people to start talking to each other and not just on Zoom. <laughs> I'd like to see people start talking to each other in the streets. You know, I'd like to start uh, seeing Republicans talk to Democrats. I think I said that earlier that one of the excitements for me is going in. There's some amazing um, Asian Republican women who are in office right now who, who you know, I want to know who are they? How do they think? What are they? How do they live? You know, what are what is important to them? And so, you know, in my mind, what we need to do is get out of our corners and start talking about our commonalities. What is it that we care about? Because honestly, safety is not a Republican or a Democratic issue. Safety is common for all of us, you know, being able to have housing for our families or, and for our loved ones, common for all of us. There are a lot of things, high speed rail, common for all of us, I would say, you know, there are just there are a lot of issues that I think we can come together and start working on. And California could be the start of that. You know, California could be the start of that, where we start, you know, uh, potentially getting out of the us versus them mentality and more towards the, what is it that the people want? Um, okay. Because I think that's absolutely critical for us. Thank you. David Campos. Uh, thank you. I, I do. I do think that dialogue is important, uh, but, but I do think that there is uh, something different and unique about Trumpism and and what's behind it. Because I think underlying it is uh, racism, is hatred uh, of, of people by virtue of skin color and and you know being foreign and and so many different things. And so I, I'm not sure that dialogue with someone who has that mentality is really possible. And and, and quite frankly, I think that it comes at a price. Uh, uh, California, I think, has a very important role to play. First of all, in making sure that Trump isn't reelected and making sure that we don't lose control of the Congress, of the House of Representatives and the Senate. Uh, and and I'm very proud to be involved in that effort as the vice chair of the California Democratic Party. And, and it's something that I started as the chair of the San Francisco Democratic Party, where we ran red to blue SF. We need to have a similar operation. I, I agree with Mr. Mahmoud that that while 2024 is important 2022 has to be has to be the most immediate concern right now because we are at a serious uh, a, a really serious risk of losing the house of representatives 
uh, and, and the Senate. And I think that San Francisco in particular has an important role to play in helping Nancy Pelosi retain control of the House and helping with the U.S. Senate. And, you know, I think that we need to run another similar operation to Red to Blue SF and vote Blue SF in 2020. We need to do that to make sure that we control uh, the Congress at, with an eye towards 2022. Uh, but the second point is that as much as I hope we do everything we can to keep uh, Trump or someone like Trump being elected, if that does happen, California has to be the tip of the spear of the resistance. We, by virtue of our diversity, by virtue of the size of our economy, again, the fifth largest economy in the world, we have an opportunity to push back against the hatred. And I'm very proud that we did that as a state, and not only statewide, but we did it at local levels, like in San Francisco, Santa Clara, these cities, these counties, you know, they sued the Trump administration. And so I think that we have to be ready to do that. But I think that for us to be in a position and the strongest position to do that, first, we have to take care of our own business. We have to address some serious issues facing the state. And that has to do with Medicare for all, making that a reality, a Green New Deal, a public school system that's properly funded. And, and what I would say, uh, and, and I will note this uh, as a Democrat, what I think makes Democrats successful is when we actually stand up for democratic values, when we actually fight for the things that make us different from Republicans, where we don't try to be Republican light, but we actually stand up for what we are, who we are as a party. And I think that if we do that, uh, that we can do that. And, and I'll be honest with you, that means fighting the power that corporate interests have within the Democratic Party. You have these corporate Democrats that are being elected throughout the state who say the right things, and when they're elected, they don't do the right thing. We just saw that happen yesterday with uh, a couple, couple of days ago with AP 1400. And if we're gonna be successful, we need to not only say the right thing, we have to do the right thing. Okay, thank you. And Matt Haney. Great, well, this is probably one where you're gonna have a lot of agreement from all of us. I, I agree with, with all of that was said, that was said. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I would add is that uh, a lot of what we're seeing is attacks on voting rights and trying to essentially steal the vote. And that's happening in, in how they're, you know, with gerrymandering, it's happening um, with creating new barriers to be able to vote in other states. And California is going to have to really demonstrate what it looks like to go in the other direction. And we're doing that now by making sure we're sending ballots home to everyone. And this is probably a time to get in a plug that you should, you, you, if you're a voter, you've got your ballot and if you live in San Francisco, you can vote directly. You know, we have to be expanding uh, access to voting and protecting the right to vote as well. And we're going to have an important role to play um, in litigation, our attorney general's office, uh, really standing up to attacks on voting across the country. And so I, I think we really have to support not only demonstrating what it looks like to expand access to voting here, but also um, uh, actually challenging some of what's happening around the country. And, and that's true for other areas as well. I think as, as um, Chief of Staff Campo said, there, there, are, there is an element of what is happening around the country that are is attacks on uh, immigrants, attacks on women, attacks on the LGBT community. And to be a part of the resistance means that we have to not only demonstrate what it looks like to protect those communities here, but actually go beyond that. You know, we've been very involved here in, you know, boycotting travel to some states that are attacking women's rights and abortion rights, our LGBT rights. Um, these are things that San Francisco, that California is going to have to do to use the power that we have, the economic power, the political power, the power of litigation uh, to, to challenge uh, folks who are under attack across the country and make sure that we protect civil rights and human rights and immigrant rights uh, here in California. Thank you. And, and now the Commonwealth Club of California, of course, is nonpartisan, uh, so we don't endorse candidates, but uh, we do endorse voting. So uh, and in fact, if you're in our district, uh, our building is going to be a voting a polling place on Election Day. So we encourage everyone to if you have not already mailed in a vote to do so either before or on Election Day. So 
Let's wrap up and let's give each of you a minute or two to make your closing statement. Now we started out alphabetically, so let's go in reverse order this time. Thea? Thank you so much. And I really want to thank the Commonwealth Club and Michelle Miao and yourself, Mr. Zipper, for a wonderful um, forum today. It's always great to uh, discuss these things and to hear people's opinions. Um, I want to I want to first of all say that, um, you know, I was one of the people who uh, worked on the legislation to boycott states that were attacking women's rights. Um, and one of the things that I um, you know, I bring to the table and I think, you know, people say, well, why does it matter that you're a woman? Well, I have had experiences and I've also been involved with places like Planned Parenthood. Um, I was actually from Texas and um, in high school, I did a paper on Planned Parenthood um, back in the day. And um, I am appalled, absolutely appalled. So I will add to what the gentleman here said to say that women's rights and reproductive rights are so, so very strong. They could be stronger, but they're very strong in California. And if there is, you know, one place where I'd like us to start to fight back and let's start with Texas, if we could, um, they would be with women's rights where I feel like, you know, we have it in our laws. Nobody is taking this away from us. Um, and um, so that's something just to add to the last question. But women, you know, make up 50 percent of our, our state. Um, and unfortunately, it's been hard to get them elected. And I am a grassroots candidate. I have I love to run, by the way. I love knocking and walking. I love talking to people. I love hearing what they care about. If I didn't, I probably wouldn't be doing this because it's really it's an uphill battle. But I am the grassroots candidate. I am the only one in this race who has a lot of life experiences, um, including, of course, raising a family and having a small business and making a safe, thriving, and inclusive neighborhood while doing my uh, City College of San Francisco. So I would love for you to consider voting for me um, if you care about education, if you care about safety in your neighborhood, if you care about transportation. We haven't talked much about that, but I'm the co-chair of the San Francisco Transit Riders. I was a high-speed rail authority board member. I want to get that high-speed rail to San Francisco, and I want to make sure that we fund transportation so that we have our uh, climate change. You know, we didn't talk about climate change either, but 47% of our climate emission, our carbon emissions, unfortunately, in this city do come from transportation. And I will be working lickety split on that when I get to the assembly. Um, but if you care about all those things and you want to try something different, elect a woman, vote for me uh, on February or before February 15th. Thank you. Thank you. Bilal Mahmood. Uh, thank you, everyone, for having us, and thank you, Commonwealth Club, for hosting. Um, as we just covered in the last question, I think this race is really important. Um, whatever San Francisco does, the rest of the state will follow, and the rest of the state will lead on the rest of the country. And 2022 is a change year. It's an election year in many different contexts, and uh, we have to lead because issues like housing and small business and climate change, schools, civil rights, they're all on the line. And the foundations of our city need to ensure that San Francisco remains a cosmopolitan city for all. We have to ensure that we are that beacon of hope again for the middle class, like it was for my parents when they immigrated here. And that dream is under threat. And we need to take a hard look at how do we recover that? And we need bold change and outcomes to deliver. We need new leadership that delivers on outcomes and not just words. And we need, we need change that's not the status quo to deliver against the status quo. So ask yourself if politicians couldn't solve these challenges in San Francisco. How can we expect different results in Sacramento? And that's why we need different leadership, different types of experience. I've worked across science, business, and policy from the Obama administration, the private sector. And from that framework, we built innovative programs that in months have helped hundreds of workers in my nonprofit experience get a guaranteed income or small business loans. Um, to helping thousands of small businesses get access to capital and technology. And so being in the public sector, the private sector, we've operated from principle, we've operated with courage, and we operate with action. 
And that's why I've been proud to be endorsed by so many different organizations in the city as a first-time candidate. From EMB Action to the San Francisco Women's Political Committee to the Eastern Neighbor Democratic Club, we've raised more than most of our opposition, despite not being in the political machine for two decades, and mobilized hundreds of volunteers. Every day I go out, so many people say that this is the first time they're voting, or this is the first time they've ever volunteered in a political campaign, because people recognize this is a change year. It's our time for change. So once in a decade election, and perhaps the last decade we have a left uh, to address things like climate and housing and inequality. And so we need leaders who will deliver on outcomes and act with conviction because across history, it's outsiders who reshape the trajectory of our country. So I hope you'll join us on this movement uh, in San Francisco in the weeks ahead. Uh, you can check us out more at BilalForAssembly.com. Uh, but thanks again and, and vote February 15th. So take care, everyone. And Matt Haney. Well, thank you again to the Commonwealth Club uh, and to Michelle. Uh, again, I hope you're feeling better. Uh, you know, as, as you've heard uh, over the last hour or so, there are a huge number of challenges that we are facing as a state, how to make housing more affordable by building more of it, uh, how do we confront climate change, make sure our city is, is safe, uh, how do we make sure our public schools are well run and fully funded, uh, and the person who San Francisco sends to Sacramento is going to have a big say in that. We need somebody who is a determined, proven, effective leader who can go up there and immediately hit the ground running and start to deliver solutions. Um, these things are too serious uh, to send someone who, uh, who, who hasn't delivered or have shown results on those things um, and who hasn't been a force for change. I have in my work, uh, in every role that I've had, uh, fought for real change and progress. Uh, fought to build housing, fought to get people off the streets, fought to have a CEO tax and a new department of sanitation and all of the things that we know need to change in our city. But all of this is not enough if we don't also see leadership at a much bigger level at the state. Um, San Francisco is not going to on our own solve the homelessness crisis or drug epidemic. Um, we need state leadership and shared responsibility uh, I will bring in a background in that and an urgency, a determination, uh, an ability to deliver for our city that I think is in the tradition that our former uh, outgoing assembly member, David Chu, brought uh, a real ability to deliver progressive, effective, bold solutions for our city. Uh, and uh, yes, please remember to vote. Voting is happening right now. And I think you've got about 12 days. And uh, again, thank you so much. And thank you to, to my fellow um, candidates uh, for being here and for, for your determination as well. And David Campbell. Thank you again, Commonwealth Club. Uh, thank you to Michelle Miao. Hope you feel better to John uh, for hosting us today. Many of you know my story. You know my story of coming to this country as an undocumented kid, as a dreamer who crossed the border in search of the American dream. Uh, my family and I risked our lives to be here. Uh, and I believe in the American dream. I believe in the California dream and in the San Francisco dream. But the reality is that this dream uh, is out of reach for so many San Franciscans. And ultimately this campaign is about making that dream a reality for so many. And let me be clear, I, I am not the candidate of the establishment. The establishment, the interests that want the status quo to remain are against me in this campaign. Uh, and there's a saying in Spanish, dime con quien andas y te diré quien eres. Tell me who you're with and I'll tell you who you are. The reality is that there are the corporate interests, the business interests, uh, developers that want more luxury housing, they're not supporting my candidacy. In fact, they're running a negative campaign against me. I am proud, though, that I have with me the Sierra Club, the Harvey Milk Club, the Roseback Democratic Club, the San Francisco Bernie Crafts. I'm not on the board of supervisors, and yet a majority of supervisors are supporting my candidacy. People who don't necessarily agree on anything are agreeing on my candidacy. Tom Amiano, Aaron Peskin agree with Willie Brown that I'm the right choice. And why am I the right choice? Because they have seen me, one, the conviction, the character to be true to who I am and not see where the wind is blowing to tell you what I believe. And second, they have seen me deliver results, deliver universal healthcare in San Francisco, deliver clean power SF, run, help to run a county in Santa Clara County. That is what is needed. But I will end with this because this is critical. It's not enough to say the right things when you're running. 
it's important to also do the right things, which is why we have chosen to take no corporate contributions in this campaign, because I believe that the system is not working precisely because politicians say that they want change, but at the same time are taking money from the corporate interests that are against that change. We are not taking a single penny from any corporation because when we are elected, we are going to be beholden only to you, the voter. Join this effort. It is time. It is time that we have someone who's a champion for the people. The corporations have their champions. Vote for me to be your champion in Sacramento. Thank you very much. Thanks all of you. And uh, we have, we've definitely run over time. So I appreciate everyone sticking around for us. Thanks to our, again, to our guests on this Michelle Miao show at the Commonwealth Club. Last but not least, thanks to all of you for watching or listening to this program online. You can find more programs at commonwealthclub.org. Stay safe and have a good weekend. Goodbye.